Good morning. Welcome to worship today. If you're able, uh, join us in uh, a song of praise as we begin. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Can we get the slide up there, guys? Thank you. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the is all about uh, bringing him honor and glory and praise and Hebrews chapter 4 says this it, it says an interesting thing there's there's a passage here we know so well and we don't realize sometimes what it's tied to but you've heard the word of God is sharper than a double-edged sword right dividing down to joint and marrow and and all of this and sometimes uh, that can be a rather intimidating thought but you know what that precedes it's it's this that we have a great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God. And so it says, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us in our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we have yet without sin, interceding for us. What a wonderful Savior. And so uh, if you're able, stand and join us as we sing, we want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see Jesus lifted high, no banner that flies across this land, that all men might see the truth and know He is the way. We're gonna see, we're gonna see 
see Jesus lifted high. So let's lift him high now with uh, these thoughts from uh, John chapter 10. And your part's in bold. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus says, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for the life that we know in you by your grace. Thank you for the abundance of life we find in you. And the Lord says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. It is so far beyond our comprehension that you would lay down your life for us. All honor and praise to you, Lord, for your amazing grace. And finally, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me. And I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Lord, cause us to rest in the peace and joy of knowing you and being known by you and help us to make you known. pray together and as we do let's let's begin just by singing a cappella lord you are more precious than silver lord you are more precious than silver lord you are more costly than gold lord you are more beautiful than diamonds, and nothing I desire compares with you. Oh, Lord Jesus, make that true for us this morning. Make that true to the depths of our being. Help us, as a result of worshiping together today, to value you more greatly for we realize that, that when we delight in you, we live to the fullest. And we pray that you'd be glorified in us today, that we'd be attentive to your word, that we'd have open hearts to your spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, 
In Jesus' name, amen. Can I have the kids come up front? How's the summer going so far? Awesome. Awesome? Wow, that's great. Well, you know what else is coming up in about a week? Vacation Bible School. Yeehaw. Okay. <laughs> Are you guys awake? Yeah. Okay. Well, let me tell you a little bit about Vacation Bible. First question now, guys, turn around and look at everybody out there. Your parents, turn around and look. Question for the congregation. How many of you have been to a vacation Bible school as a kid or even your kids? Now, there's a few hands out there. Well, it's happening in about a week. And it's going to start at 2 o'clock. At 2 o'clock, there's going to be crafts. Then about, I don't know, 2.45 is a snack. Then we have a special team coming in at 3 o'clock to help us this year. And it's a whole bunch of young teenagers that are just on fire for God and Jesus. And they're going to help us out this year. So it's going to be a good time. But you want to know what some of their topics are going to be? Day one. Um, this first character that they're going to talk about is going to be called Turnabout. So taking somebody's life that was kind of bad, didn't believe, and understanding and receiving Jesus as their Savior. And the first one was this little tax collector. He's real small. And, you know, tax collectors back in those days of Jesus were corrupt and mean, and they just, you know, demanded stuff for the, the king and the queen and all that stuff. They were just naughty. And so, but he was real curious about Jesus, and Jesus was coming in this town, and he went up to the sycamore tree to see him. Do you know this story? Zacchaeus, you think? Well, we'll find out, but what happens with Zacchaeus when he climbs this tree and God talks to him, or Jesus does? We'll find out the rest of the story. Okay, then the second one, oh, this is one I don't know very well, but he was five years old, okay? And his grandpa was a king, and his dad were both killed in war. And usually when they're fighting, one side will try to eliminate the other side's royal family and stuff so they don't pop up against somewhere. So this person taking care of this little five-year-old, they call it a nurse, she took him as she was running to exile to hide him. She tripped and fell, and he was crippled. He couldn't move. So they went to exile, and this new king, David, wanted to find people that were related to this king going back. And, but he was in exile, scared to death, because he might be killed. Do you know what happened next? We'll find out at VBS. So you're going to have to come to find out. It's a really neat story. Uh, then the next one, uh, you guys know this one very well. He was called by God um, to build this huge ark. Yeah, was that Moses? No, no that was Noah. That was Noah. <laughs> But would you believe Noah had some issues in sin, too? Okay. Um, he used to like to drink wine, a lot of wine. Okay. And he embarrassed his kids and everything. So we're going to talk about that. Even though he's a godly man, did all this stuff for God, he still had sin in his life. And we'll talk about that one. Then the next one, this is the one I really like. Uh, this man was angry at Christians. He did not like Christians at all. He yelled, screamed at them, nasty threats. He beat them and he sometimes killed them. That's the type of person that he was, just mean. But one day he was on the road to Damascus and this bright light came over him. Okay, And he went to his knees and it was so bright. Uh, when he opened his eyes, he was blind. And then Jesus talked to him, or God did, and says, go to this town. Do you know what happened next? We'll find out at VBS. 
that you have to come to find out the end of these stories. And the last one um, is about this guy. He was um, the treasurer for this very wealthy queen down in Ethiopia. Okay? And he came 500 miles to Jerusalem to worship God. But, you know, he had a lot of power. He had a chariot, very, very, you know, power, powerful type person. And God told Philip, go to him. So he went about 20 miles, and he said, go to his chariot now. So he walked up to his chariot. I'd be scared to death because here's somebody in power and, you know, a lot of influence and looked down on everybody, as far as we know, you know. So he went up to his chariot and put his hand on the chariot. You know what happened next? No, it's where you have a horse in front and you stand behind the horse. It's like on wheels. It's like a wagon. So he had one of those, and very few people had those back in those days. So Philip went up, put his hand on it. And you know what happened next? You have to come to VBS to find out. <laughs> so that's the five stories. And within it, there's going to be games, music, fun, snacks, the whole bit. So I ho just hope you guys are coming. I know quite a few signed up. Some are going to be out of town. But bring a friend. Because if you bring a friend, there's going to be a prize. So bring a friend, OK? Can you do that? So that's next week, starting August 6th through the 10th. And yes, adults, we are still looking for some helpers for snacks and the crafts. So please see me. We could use your help. And I do have some handouts for you guys to give to your friends and whoever. So. Can we pray? Um, Lord, uh, just be with us, the kids, as we come up onto VBS. It's around the corner. And just touch the lives of these young people. Spread the word through them, a word of education as well as for the adults. So just be with us as we come toward the beginning of VBS. And I just pray that the kids can make it and bring a friend. So in his name we say amen. And I do have some flyers here for you guys. You can pass them out to your friends. You can bring three friends, yes, that would be great. More the better. Do we have some of those where uh, Thank you. congregation can pick them up? Yep. Great. I'll put them on both sides. Okay, so invite your uh, neighbors, grandkids, whatever. Uh, sounds like it's going to be a great week. Thank you, Brad. Let's pray before we turn to our scripture reading. Father, once again, we open your word, confessing that we regard this as holy, inspired by you, authoritative, living, and so let your living word speak to us again. Make us ready to hear it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're back in the New Testament in Matthew's Gospel, and uh, so you, you could turn there if you'd like. We're going to put it on the screen, and uh, you can see by the graphic we just had up there what the text is all about. It's the one, but, you know, it's easier to, to thread a camel through the eye of a needle um, one, of, one of the real interesting texts of, of the New Testament, interesting saying of Jesus. So let's look at uh, the story that lies behind that. It's the story of a, a rich young man. And I'm going to begin reading in Matthew chapter uh, 19 with verse 16, and we'll read through verse 30. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ through Matthew, his servant. Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones? The man inquired. Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I've kept 
the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Peter answered him, we've left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Of course, Jesus made that statement in other contexts too. So what do you think of that? Wow. This reminded me of, of a guy that um, visited a church I pastored once, and uh, when I met him at the door, he almost immediately said, we want to join this church. I thought, that's a little odd. First visit, we want to join this church. And, and someone took me aside later and said, uh, he might not be the best member. He was oldish, set in his ways, relatively poor, fallen out of grace with most people who knew him, and uh, not a rule keeper, but a rule breaker. Not the first person you'd recruit, but he did end up coming into the life of our church and, uh, and then disappointing many of us. But the guy in this text is the exact opposite of all that, isn't he? He's the one that we would all regard as an ideal church member, a perfect recruit. He's relatively young. We could use more of, more of those people, right? He's uh, relatively wealthy, quite well-to-do apparently. He is prominent in his social standing. He's called a ruler in some translations. He, wa he wasn't like a guy that worked for the government, but he was probably a ruler of the local synagogue, a religious ruler, somebody that, that had been serving well and was highly regarded by the people within Judaism. And when Matthew tells a story, he uses a terminology that, that in the first verse, if we were to translate it very literally, it'd be, and look, and look, there's this young, wealthy, influential person who comes to Jesus. And he not only comes to Jesus, but, but he comes seeking, right? He's interested in, in knowing what Jesus thinks. He wants to hear from this teacher. And he's a person who has kept the rules. He's done a pretty good job abiding by a lot of the rules that people expected him to follow. Jesus ticks some off for him, and he's able to say, well, I've done all that. I've done it. What more can I do, Jesus? He wanted to make sure his bases were well covered. And we can imagine that he thought they probably were, but he just wanted to be sure. And maybe he wanted to hear some affirmation from Jesus. Maybe he wanted Jesus to say what undoubtedly a lot of other people had said to him. You're doing great, buddy. Keep it up. And yet he went away sad, didn't he? Isn't that amazing? This, this perfect recruit comes to Jesus, and he goes away sad. So today, I just want us to focus on some of the reasons he went away sad. Why did he go away sad? Why does the story end this way? And, and we kind of get the impression that Jesus is a little wistful, too, because this, this man who had so much going for him walks away instead of accepting his invitation to follow. And I want to suggest to you today he went away sad for a number of reasons. And here are some of them. One, he talked to the real Jesus. He talked to the real Jesus. He met the real Jesus. He heard the real message from Jesus. 
And when you meet the real Jesus, you always get shocked. They did, didn't they? When he spoke to people in his hometown, they got shocked. When he told parables, they got shocked. Some of the disciples said, really? Explain this to us. Oftentimes, when, when Jesus laid it out for people, what he said to them wasn't exactly what they were expecting. And especially if, if they had been, you know, religiously devout for a long time, they, did, they didn't always get the message they expected to hear. And we didn't really expect Jesus to answer in the way he did, do we? He says, what must I do to, to inherit eternal life? What do, what do I have to do, Lord? And Jesus says, well, what are the commandments? We expect him to have some kind of message of grace or, or to say, first of all, follow me and we'll work that all out. But he starts with the commandments. We didn't really expect Jesus to start there, do we? And then, and then Jesus gives him some random commandments. He gives him five of the Ten Commandments, actually. And it happens to be the five that have to do with other people, not so much Godward. And we think, well, maybe that's because those are harder to fake. You know, you can say you have this attitude toward God, but how is that playing out in the way that you relate to other people? So Jesus starts with that second tablet of the law, and he ticks off about, you know, five of them, and then he throws in, for good measure, Leviticus 19 the second part of his summary of the law in other chapters, and, and love your neighbor as yourself. And he lays it out for the man. And the man says, I've got this. I've got it. And Jesus answers something like this, really? Okay, let's start with the first one. Let's go back to the first commandment. See, that's what he does really when he, asks, when, when he gives him the assignment is, is he worshiping God above all? He calls that into question. And he says to the man, if you want to be complete, perfect is, is one translation. Yeah, it really just means if you want to be complete, if you want God's work to be complete in you, then go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and then come follow me. And selling and giving to the poor wouldn't earn him eternal life. It doesn't earn anybody eternal life. Even if we did all that, even if we responded in that extreme way, sold everything we had and gave it all away. And by the way, Jesus doesn't call everybody to do that. He calls this man in particular to do that because he knew what was going on within, within the heart of this man. But even if he did all that, that wouldn't earn him eternal life. It's not what Jesus is saying. But he knew that for this man... That would put the finger on a step that he needed to take to trust Jesus. That would touch him where his idols were. That would deal with the thing that was keeping him from responding to the gospel. It was a first step that would indicate his trust in Jesus. He walked away because he talked to the real Jesus and, and he heard what he really needed to hear, but not what he expected to hear or wanted to hear. He walked away sad because the real Jesus smashed some of his basic assumptions about the way that religion works, right? There were, there were two of them in particular that I noticed this week as I looked at this passage, and, and the one is that faith is something you can add. He seems to want to add faith to everything else he has. So he's, he's done all these things, he's kept all these commandments, is there anything else? Is there anything else I can add? Is there anything else I should do? And, and yet, there were facets of his way of life that he didn't want to give up. He wanted to have that and have Jesus too. And some people have suggested he comes almost in a patronizing way to Jesus. I, don't, I think that may be stretching it a little bit. But, but, you know, he wants to hear an affirming word about his religious activity. And yet, there are some things he wants to have as well. And the Lord said, elsewhere, right? You can't serve both God and mammon. You can't serve two things. There can't be two kings on the throne in our lives. We can't have two first priorities. We all have all kinds of priorities, but we can't have two first priorities. And in this man's life, there was something else that was keep competing for first priority. And for him, that happened to be his wealth. He wanted to add something to everything else he had. You know, sometimes we, we present the gospel that way. We say to people, well, you know, 
just invite Jesus into your heart. Whatever you're doing, whoever you are, just invite Jesus into your heart is all you need to do. And, and that's a step, receiving his grace. But we know, too, the truth is when we receive him, that there are some other things in our lives that are going to get displaced by that. By natural necessity, they'll be displaced by his presence in us. There was something else the man had wrong about in, in terms of his, his, uh, how, he, how he viewed religious works is that faith is something that you can do, right? He said to Jesus, what do I need to do to get eternal life, to obtain eternal life? Jesus does an interesting thing. He's, he switches the verb when he answers the man and he talks about how he can enter eternal life, not how he's going to take hold of it or earn it or, or get it, obtain it for himself, but how he can enter eternal life. And he answers not with one more thing that the man can do, but, but, but with, with some answers that get at the heart of what he's thinking and at the heart of what his struggle really is. So he takes him back to that first command. Is, is, are you worshiping and, and honoring God above all? Or are there other gods in your life? Are there other idols? The Bible calls that mammon. We usually take that mammon, archaic word, and, and we translate it just money. But that's not all mammon is in Scripture. Mammon is sort of the stuff we trust in. And Jesus says elsewhere, you can't serve God and, and trust in other stuff and hold those equally. That's not how we're saved. And apparently this man was trusting in a lot of this other stuff he did for his security before God. And Jesus rightly went in and undermined that, that confidence. We need to continually remind that, ourselves of that, that faith isn't the things we do, right? Ever been at a funeral where, where somebody was really talked up? <laughs> where the eulogies got uh, a little flowery? Tim Keller talks about uh, situations like that where he as a pastor is, is officiating and he says that when he was a young pastor, he used to, you know, he'd just take in everything that somebody said about the deceased and he'd wo wove together this beautiful eulogy of, of, of who they were and, and, and then he'd look at the family in the front pew and he'd see some of them squirming. Because dad was a wonderful person and, and saved by God's grace, perhaps, but, but uh, the preacher was making dad look a whole lot better than dad was. <laughs> and so there's, a, you know, I, re I remember the, uh, feeling that way at the, at the funeral of my own father, who is a, a wonderful man. And later in life, when he really became alive to God, ended up spending a lot of his, his retirement years with my mom, volunteering for Wycliffe Bible translators and so on. But you know what? That was the only slice of my dad that the preacher knew. And so he, he talked about how Doug's one passion in life was Wycliffe and, and all this stuff. And I'm thinking, that's not my dad. <laughs> and, and it felt awkward. You know, and, and the reason we do that is because in the, in the back of our mind, we still want to add something to what Jesus has done. We, you know, we want to believe that the works we do merit something. And everything we do for the Lord will be rewarded and it will all be so much more than worthwhile, but not in terms of meriting anything. And this man needed, needed to come face to face with that, even if it meant that he might turn and walk the other way because he wasn't ready to accept the grace of God, it, 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 totally divorced from any merit that he himself might have. Both nice, nice and nasty people try to merit salvation by their own efforts. And there are both nice and nasty people who are leaning on the grace of God. Jesus further got, got personal with this man. He refused to stay academic and theoretical. To, to follow required more than just acknowledging some truths or, or ticking off a to-do list. Mark adds, Jesus looked at him and loved him.
And Jesus really, in inviting him to follow, said, I, I want your dreams. I want your dreams. Does Jesus have your dreams? Does your relationship with him mean more than anything? And what the Lord did in that was to, was to expose the man's barrier and invite him to take that step. Everything you're trusting instead needs to be laid down when you follow Jesus. And the, the fourth reason the man walked away sad was he didn't understand the treasure of heaven. He didn't understand the treasure of heaven. What treasures are in heaven? Well, it starts now. In, in, in the New Testament language, the treasure of eternal life begins now and then continues into an age that will go on forever in the presence of the Lord. And Jesus says, that will be a hundred times better than anything you give up in following me. A hundred times better than anything else you would rely on in this life. If you have Jesus and only Jesus, you're rich. Do you believe that? If you have Jesus and only Jesus, you're rich. You've got something that nobody can take away. When we come face to face with this passage, one of the things we're called to understand is, is that not, not only that our treasure is in Him, but, but to realize that His treasure is us, that He treasures us, that, that, that He wants us to be part of His heavenly kingdom. Howard Hendricks said it in a way that you've probably heard expressed before because it's kind of a famous phrase that there's nothing you could do in your life that would make God love you less and there's nothing you could do that would make God love you more. That's what the gospel is about. That he loves us simply because he chooses to love us. And that what we need more than anything else is just to receive that love. And when we have, we've really got something to look forward to. You know, Scripture says that, that He has our names engraved on the palms of His hands. Isn't that a beautiful image? Isn't that a, a wonderful way to be able to think about God, that God has your name engraved on the palms of His hands? That, that's like tattooed, okay? Let's just say it. How many of you have... No, we're not going to ask how many have tattoos. <laughs> you, could, you could have a tattoo uh, here and uh, maybe no one would ever see it. You could have a tattoo in some other places and people would even be less likely to see it, right? But, but if you've got a tattoo right here, people are going to notice that and you're going to notice it every time you set out to do something. You're going to be reminded of that. That's how much the Lord cares for each one of us. And there could be no greater treasure ever. And Jesus tells us elsewhere, that's something that no thief can break in and take, right? Nobody can take that away from you. I was in Quick Trip this morning. Probably shouldn't say this. I don't know. I was in Quick Trip getting my coffee, and I'm standing by the coffee machine. There's, there's a guy in there talking to a gal next to him, and, and he's talking about living on, uh, in a particular place in town where um, maybe the crime rate is a little higher than it is in your neighborhood. And he said, uh, well, I've got a 357 Magnum loaded and ready. And she's like, whoa, that's pretty good. And he says, not so good for the person that breaks in my house. You know? <laughs> nobody, nobody can take away. We're so afraid of people taking away what we have. But when our treasure is in him, nobody can ever take that away from you. Nobody can ever steal it. And, and we're moth or rust can't because, you know, you can protect what you have. Our friend from Quick Trip could have his 357 loaded and, and maybe nobody ever dare to take anything away from him, but one day, everything he has, he's not going to have anymore, right? And it's that way for you and that way for me, except for what we have in Christ. And it's never going to perish or spoil or fade. Kept in heaven for us, the Bible says. So we've ignored the camel, haven't we? <laughs> what was Jesus talking about there? People have tried to explain that in so many ways, and I bet you've heard some of these explanations because I have. I've, I've accepted some of them from time to time. One of them goes like this. The word for camel and the word for rope are very similar, 
So somebody probably just misplaced a vowel along the way. And what Jesus really meant was it's harder to get a relatively small rope through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. I don't know what that really accomplishes because I can barely do it with thread. So you're not, I mean, you're not even going to get a kite string through a needle, right? <laughs> but, but uh, you know, it's an attempt to soften what Jesus says a little bit. The more famous attempt to soften what he says a little bit is this. Maybe you've heard this. Well, there's this gate in Jerusalem called the Eye of the Needle. And uh, it's not a really big gate. And if you were to take a camel through that gate, you'd have to get the camel to kneel first and then squeeze it through the gate. How many have heard that explanation of Eye of the Needle? The only problem with that is we don't really have any evidence that that was called the Eye of the Needle. And that particular gate didn't exist until long after the time of Jesus. <laughs> Aw, nuts. So what the Lord is doing is he's using the kind of hyperbole he uses on many occasions. And he's talking about a real needle and a real camel. And he's talking about a rich man. Some of us would say, well, yeah, he's so filthy rich, he's not open to God or whatever. That wasn't the perception people had at the time. The, the perception they had is, you're rich, you're blessed. If, if this rich man who cares about spiritual things can't get in, they say, who can be saved? And Jesus says, it's impossible with man. And he wasn't just applying it to rich people everywhere. It's hard for any of us by our own effort to get into the kingdom of God. How hard? As hard as stuffing a camel through the eye of a needle. In other words, impossible. We can never do it by our own works. Nobody will ever be good enough. And then Jesus says what's impossible with man is possible with God by the miracle of his grace. And his disciples would see how real that was a short time later when he gave his life for us all so that we could be reconciled with God based on his performance, not based on our performance. See, this guy was all about performance. And we got to admire him. He tried hard. He was diligent. But what he needed was grace, not performance. What he needed was not to obtain eternal life, but to inherit it. So with this passage, we tear up our checklist. And we look to Jesus in faith. And by the way, there were some rich people who apparently did that. People like Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who were probably just as wealthy as this guy and just as influential and just as, just as much steeped in the Hebrew Scriptures, but apparently saw in Jesus the Messiah that all of his people were longing for. We might not be rich, but we all have the potential of something we could trust in rather than trust in Him, that could become a surrogate God for us. And it, it might not be riches, it might be a special man or a special woman in your life, or it could be a degree that, that you take pride in, or it could be a career, or it could be the acceptance of your peers, or it could be a pleasure you're addicted to. And when we realize that that's what's going on, we need to lay it aside. And to say, Lord, help me. Jesus, by your grace, take control of my life. So that unlike this man, we don't go away sad, but we go away with the greatest joy that no one can ever steal from us. And so this morning, let's pray that God would grant... Uh, us each to rest purely on His grace, that God would grant for each of us to hold any competing gods loosely, and that God would grant each of us an opportunity to introduce somebody to His wonderful grace in Jesus. Maybe you're a ways along in life and you are at a point where you don't really find yourself making any new acquaintances or friends, but maybe there's somebody that you've known for a long time 
that you could remind of the grace of God. Maybe you could even say, you know, it's, we've known each other a long time, but I've never had a chance to tell you what God's done for me in Jesus. Pray about that. We just commissioned a team to go share their faith in Alaska, and, and we have a wonderful faith to share right where we are. So let's pray, and, and uh, as we pray, let, let's take just a moment to consider uh, anything we ought to pray together as a community. Obviously, we're going to pray for the team that we just sent off. Uh, we want to pray for some of our members who are uh, homebound or nursing homebound or ill. Or we want, we want to um, remember as well um, Kevin Henriksen's dad, who is fighting a battle with cancer. And, and tell us your dad's name. Just again. Alan, thank you. I know you told me that before, and I it just slipped my mind. Anyone else that we should pray for today? All right. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, one of your disciples long, long ago prayed that a, a group of believers, much like ourselves, would be faithful in their partnership in the gospel, and that God would carry on the good work that he had begun in them, and carry it on to completion, to fruition, until the day of Jesus Christ. And we pray that for ourselves this morning that our love would abound more and more in a deep knowledge of you. That our love for one another and our love for those who don't know you would be a reflection of the love we know you have for us. Help us to love more perfectly. And we pray that you'd give us discernment. Help us know what's best. Help us make decisions about our lives that are godly. Help us see when there are things that compete for our loyalty to realize what's going on and to give ourselves fully to you. Help us to turn again and again to you for the healing and the correcting and the strengthening that we need. Lord, make us pure and blameless by your grace until the day of Jesus. Fill us with the fruit of righteousness. Help us to really live what we believe. Help us to be more consistent in modeling what you're like, Lord Jesus. And we pray that our lives would be lived in such a way that our lives would be to the glory and praise of you. We want to lift up this team that's headed to Alaska this very morning. We pray uh, a prayer of rejoicing that James got his government-approved ID in time. Uh, we uh, thank you for the people that you've gathered together. We thank you for the way that uh, you have brought Lori there early to work uh, for GraceWorks and in, in preparing for, for other teams. We ask that your blessing would be on Whitney and on Kristen and Albert and Natalie and James and Joseph and Allison and Damon and Joyce and Julie and Lori and others they work with. We ask that You'd let them be such a blessing to the children they work with that, that they would see in them Jesus reflected and they'd begin to believe how much you really care for them and that they'd rest in, in your love and accept your gospel and find life in you. And we pray for their families as well, that there might be good, fruitful connections with parents and caregivers. We pray that you keep our team safe and... and uh, uh, neighborhoods where there is some danger, we pray that, that the children they care for would be kept in your care. We pray that the follow-up that the churches do would be good, that the seeds planted this summer will grow, that you'll build your church in Anchorage in neighborhoods that need you most. We pray that you'd teach our team members and Help them to come back to us with a new awareness of, of your grace and a new passion for your work. And 
Let them be an inspiration to us as we continue our ministry in this place. Lord, we ask that you'd wrap your, your healing mercies around Kevin's dad this morning. And we pray for others who need your touch as well. We think of Danielle Kester, and, and, and we ask that your grace would be abundant to her and that, that you'd bring greater health to her. We pray for Dylan Lawrence, Lord, that you would walk with him and, and all of his needs, care for him. We, we ask for some of our elderly who are homebound that, that you would watch over them and protect them, that, that there might not be falls and injuries and, and some of the other things that can lead to such rapid setbacks. We pray for those who are um, in the care of skilled care homes and nursing homes, that, that you'd restore them to health. We pray for those who are struggling with chronic diseases and, and ask that you'd bring healing to Edith, for example, and, and uh, Christian. And God, we ask that you'd bless the work of, of our missionaries everywhere, but we think in particular of Ann Bawalda and of the Jansen family this morning. We pray for your persecuted church throughout this world. And we ask that we might learn well from them that, that if uh, it becomes harder to be a Christian in our own land, that we would be ready for that, that we'd be up to that, that we'd have a vibrant witness, that we would not turn bitter or get defensive, but that we would be willing to trust you in, in new ways, in greater ways. We ask that you'd renew your church. How much our, our city, how much our county and state and nation and world need you, Jesus, Use our influence and help us to be your witnesses. And we pray that you would revive your church, not only in our congregation, but in, in every Christian congregation in this community. We ask that you work through Vacation Bible School even as, as it's planned. We pray, Lord, that you'd be with, with the people who live in places we're glad we don't live in, who've suffered harm through natural disasters, who who face situations and, and face poverty that, uh, that we're so thankful we don't, help us to be mindful of them and open our hearts to them as well. Lord, may your kingdom come. May your will be done. Forgive us and inspire us and help us to live as your thankful people for everything good we have comes from your hand. Remind us of that now as we give our gifts to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we uh, bring our offerings to the Lord, uh, let's offer our lives with uh, a hymn medley. We're going to begin by singing, My Jesus, I Love Thee. And we'll sing a couple verses of that and then continue into the invitation, Take My Life and, and Let It Be. So let that be our expression of devotion and our giving of ourselves as we give our gifts to God.
take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love, at the impulse of Thy my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King, always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my love, my God, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be We've got at, uh, at the doors just a couple uh, prayer sheets for our team suggesting how we might pray for them throughout this week. Some of you used it in the time before our worship, after our send-off. Unfortunately, copy ran out of toner this morning, and so uh, there's, there's a limited quantity. But um, if, you, if you have access to the website, go to the pastor's page on our website. It's there if you'd like to download it. And I'll also post the names of the team members, which you might not have uh, on the website. So please continue to remember them in prayer this week. Pray also for VBS. And if you know somebody you can invite in your neighborhood, pick up a flyer and invite them. By all means, uh, it, it will be an excellent opportunity for kids to hear what, what, who Jesus really is and what, what the message of the gospel is really all about. And then um, we may need a little extra help yet with our Father's Table tomorrow night. Um, I think the bulletin mentions who you can check with on that, so if you're able to help. And uh, the big one is uh, Ashley Verhoeven from the hospital with twins, and you may or may not know they have four other children. I saw Matt uh, this morning. He had had to work this morning. and. Uh, they, they are a very busy family right now, and sometimes in the past when there's been a, a particular need, we've reached out with a little extra help as a congregation. Um, there's an opportunity for you to do that. So um, whether you know them or not, I'd, I'd urge you to you know, sign up for a meal or I think diapers or something like that. It doesn't mean you have to change them. It just, <laughs> just help on the supply end. Uh, but are, there are some sign-up sheets in both entrances. It's a wonderful way for us to, to love one another and care for each other in the family of God, and hopefully we can do that for a lot of people. But uh, if, if you get an opportunity, please consider signing up for that. And uh, hope you can all stay for some time of fellowship after worship today. Um, as we go from this place, may the Lord bless you, keep you, and use you mightily to show the world around us what his love is really all about. God bless you.